Good morning or good afternoon, everyone, depending on where you're joining us from. And welcome to today's webinar. My name is Eugenia from Business Review, and I will be your host today. It's our pleasure to have Klaus Match with us today, and we will be, uh, who will be presenting this webinar titled Strategic Compliance Management. Today's guest speakers are Michael Rasmussen, GRC analyst and pundit at GRC 2020 Research, and Freddie Frith, head of financial services at Close Match. Now I will provide some house housekeeping information before we start. First of all, I would like to welcome everyone to our webinar platform on 24. You will notice that this webinar is browser based. So if you disconnect for any reason, please just click on the link that you received via email to rejoin the session. In order to ask questions, you can send them in via the question and answer widget. Just type them into the box at the top right corner of your screen and click submit. We will allocate some time at the end of the session to address any questions or thoughts that you may have. But please note, even if your questions do, uh, if, even if your question doesn't get answered today, it will be available to be answered at a later date. Um, please note um, uh, that you can also download and review different types of resources connected to the topic of this event at the bottom of your screen. In addition, we are having a short poll question in the middle of our webinar, and you can vote simply by selecting the, an the answer relevant to you and click Submit. The poll will take about 45 seconds and is absolutely anonymous. There will also be a short survey that we would appreciate you to fill out at the end of the event. Now, please allow me to welcome Michael Rasmussen. Over to you, Michael. Hello, and it is an absolute pleasure and delight to be with everybody today and talking about what I see as one of the most critical challenges in organizations, and that is strategic compliance management. Too often, compliance has been that reactive firefighting approach, and organizations need to rethink and redesign how they approach compliance management in the enterprise. The modern organization is what I call navigating chaos. If you think about it, laws and regulations are changing minute by minute, second by second. New laws and regulations, change laws and regulations, notices, proposed rulemaking, enforcement actions, and so much more. At the same time, the risk environment's changing. Look at this year, the geopolitical risk and, and the bringing on of sanctions and so much else that have impacted organizations across industries, but particularly financial services. But then the business itself is changing. You know, you've got uh, changing people and processes and technology, and you've got the extended enterprise of third party relationships and their businesses are changing. Now you can be completely knowledgeable about the law. You can, you can answer every question on the regulation, but that doesn't make you compliant if that employee wasn't aware of the policy, didn't read the policy, wasn't trained, that those policies and controls weren't kept current in the midst of all that change in the environment. No, the physicist Friedrich Copper stated, the more we study the major problems of our time, the more we come to realize that they cannot be understood in isolation. They are systemic problems, which means that they are interconnected and interdependent. Now, the physicist here at this point was talking about biological ecosystems, but he might as well have been talking about compliance and compliance risk today in the modern organization, that everything's interconnected. Those laws and regulations to the employee responsibilities and tasks and activities to the controls and policies in the environment, you know, we have to keep all this information in sync. As I've already stated, being extremely intelligent about the law and regulation does not make you compliant if, you, if the people don't understand compliance in the line of business and understand the policies. You have to keep all this in sync, and that is the challenge of compliance in today's organization. You know, you think about the greatest compliance challenges that we've been seeing, and this is coming from Thomson Reuters' Regulatory Intelligence Cost of Compliance 2021, you know, some of the key things that they found in their survey was keeping up with regulatory change, increased regulatory demands and expectations, lack of skilled resources, remote oversight of staff and activities, the volume of regulatory change, improving firm culture and conduct risk. So much has been coming at our organizations. In fact, just looking at financial services firms using the same Thomson Reuters data, Global financial services firms are dealing with 257 regulatory change events every business day coming from 1,217 regulators around the world. Think about that. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, 52 weeks out of the year, 
On average, there's 257 regulatory change events every business day. One third of those, basically 32%, are coming from North America. Just over a third, 35%, are coming from the UK and Europe. That's a lot of legal and regulatory change. So even if you're not a global firm and you're just operating within Europe or you're just operating within North America, you're still dealing with a significant volume of regulatory change, over 80 regulatory change events every business day just from those two different geographies in, in each of those geographies. Uh, it could be a new law regulation, a change law regulation, notice of proposed rulemaking. A lot of times they're enforcement actions. This is significant. This is challenging on the modern organization. And, and organizations have to keep up with this and keep current with this. But then we have this whole era of ESG, which we'll talk about more in, in, in the next slide. But compliance to me is about the integrity of the organization. You know, what we communicate to the world in our policies, in our conduct, our values, our ethics, our ESG commitments, is it a reality in the organization? Compliance is no longer just the corporate cop. In fact, we need to get away from that stigma. Compliance is the bastion of integrity. If we can rename and rebrand the chief ethics and compliance officer, I would like to call it the chief integrity officer. The challenge is we already have the CIO with the chief information officer. So the acronym is already taken. But compliance is about the integrity of the organization. That what we commu communicate that we do in our, our values, our ethics, our regulatory commitments, our contractual obligations and, and uh, so forth, that it's a reality in the organization. You know, here on my laptop, I've got a code of conduct from 20 years ago. Back in, 2020, uh, back in the year 2000, this was the model code of conduct. Other organizations were copying it to be their code of conduct. I'm talking about Enron's code of conduct. For you uh, Gen Zers out there that don't know your uh, accounting compliance history, Enron's what led to Sarbanes-Oxley uh, and, and uh, Sarbanes-Oxley compliance. You know, having a great policy is one thing, and I'm an advocate for policies. I do my policy management workshops all over the world. But you can have the most well-written policy like Enron's code of conduct, but if it's not a reality in the organization, it's just smoke and mirrors and can be a liability. You need to make sure that what you communicate in your policies, your procedures, your values, your ethics, your ESG commitments, your regulatory commitments, that it's a reality in the organization. And that's what compliance is about. But you enter this era of ESG and things become so challenging and I am seeing more and more that the chief ethics and compliance officer or chief compliance officer, if you haven't brought ethics into that specifically, the CECO or the CCO is being handed the responsibility for leading the ESG strategy of the organization. ESG has got a lot of teeth. You know, corporate investors like BlackRock and State Street are making investment decisions based on the ESG practices of organization. Individual board members are being voted out. Lots of regulatory focus. You, you look at Germany's Corporations Due Diligence Act and the similar legislation in Norway and Switzerland now and the EU directive that's going to require every member country to pass similar legislation to Germany's uh, that ex requires extensive compliance due diligence on third-party relationships around the E, the S, and the G. Lots and lots of impact on the organization from multiple angles. And it's more than the environment, although that's critical, you know, dealing with carbon emissions and, and climate change and air, water, waste and natural resources, all that's critically important. But the social aspect deals with inclusivity and diversity, uh, uh, harassment, discrimination, uh, privacy, uh, child labor, forced labor, other issues of modern slavery like prison labor. Uh, and, and, and all these fall under the S. Under the G, you've got uh, corporate governance, internal controls, information security, sanctions, anti-bribery and corruptions, uh, and, and so much. ESG re it requires a cohesive strategic approach to compliance and a compliance that's just not checkbox based, but one that's really trying to measure ESG to the integrity and values and culture of the organization. But unfortunately, a lot of comp unfortunately, a lot of compliance programs are what I call the inevitability of failure. Too many documents and manual processes. I was talking to one mid-sized bank and, and, and their RFP for software in this space, they did an internal study and found that 80% of their staff time, 80% of their compliance and risk professionals, 
80, it was being spent on chasing documents, spreadsheets, and emails. 80% of their staff time is managing documents and not managing compliance. That's an issue. Another firm I was talking to was spending 200 hours to build a report for the board of directors on all the compliance issues, events, cases, investigations, and so forth in the organization. 200 hours to build one report to find out that they had compliance issues that started 11 months ago and are now out of control. That's not managing compliance, that's reacting to compliance. And now it just is a, that same reports there at a push of a button. When you try to manage compliance on a lot of documents, spreadsheets, and emails, it becomes a complete mess. One North America well, global bank that I worked with that came to my policy management by design workshop, they came out of it saying, we don't even know how many policies we have in our environment. They did an internal discovery over three months and found 5,000 policies in North America. And then uh, over in the, the following six months, they found another 5,000 policies in the rest of the world. All these policies are issued at different levels of the organization with a lot of redundancy, out of date policies and things. Things were a mess. Too many documents, spreadsheets, emails, and manual processes for compliance leads to the inevitability of failure and exposure to the organization. In fact, I would characterize a lot of compliance programs and organizations like the Winchester Mystery House in San Jose, California. This is a sprawling mansion that was built in the 1800s. It cost $5.5 million to build then. That's one extremely expensive house today when you calculate inflation. Now, you look at this, and, and the house doesn't make any sense. It, had, it took 38 years to build. It had 147 different builders, uh, and it had no design, no blueprint, no architect. And so at the end of the day, you've got doors that open to 20 foot wall drops or doors that open to walls, staircases that go up or down to nowhere, skylights that are in floors instead of ceilings. Unfortunately, that's a lot of your compliance programs as you listen to this webinar. That over the last 38 years, you had 147 different builders of compliance in your organization. Corporate, uh, corporate compliance and ethics is doing its thing. Legal compliance is doing its thing. IT compliance is doing its thing. HR compliance is doing its thing. And it's an absolute mess. And it goes on and on at accounting compliance and all this. You know, I had a, a large insurance company come to me at the beginning of COVID-19. And they said, we've got a problem from a compliance and culture perspective. You know, we're entering the, these lockdowns and moving people to work from home environment. And we found that we have 27 different policy portals in the organization at a time where we need to streamline and make things easy in a time of crisis for people to commute to access policies and policies are changing like home office expense policies and uh, home office IT security policies and people need to be reminded of other policies like conduct policies that yes now you're using zoom and teams and everything else out of your home the same business rules apply around harassment and discrimination even when you're on your home office um you have to conduct yourself appropriately on zoom calls in other words you know all these policies are changing and they people need to be reminded of policies but they're scattered all over the place and, and there's redundancy uh you know things are a mess you know, over the last 38 years in your company, you probably had 147 different builders of the Winchester Mystery House of Compliance in your organization. Look at the talk bubbles here. There are many, too many formats and locations and different managers giving compliance orders. Who's in charge? Suggested policies and procedures are vague and often conflict with what I'm being told by others. Which one's the current one? Compliance management is confusing in a lot of organizations because there is no design no blueprint, no architect to how it should work in the organization. Well, we're in the midst of transition, a past from the Winchester Mystery House of Compliance to a future of an architected strategic, strategic approach to compliance, a past where compliance is managed in a lot of documents, spreadsheets, and emails that lacked clear audit trails and accountability, and, and people, staff was spent managing documents, not managing compliance, to a future of an integrated content and, and information management architecture for compliance that has defined compliance processes that are designed for compliance. A past where there's a lot of responsibilities for compliance or a past around the organization like a hot potato to a future of greater accountability for compliance and, and, and clear responsibilities flowing out of those accountabilities and they're being tracked, managed on and reported. One of the key aspects that I see organizations need in compliance is to be an agile and resilient organization. 
And there is a difference. Agility is the ability to move quickly and easily, the ability to think and understand quickly. While resilience is that capacity to recover quickly from difficulties, toughness, the ability of a substance or object to spring into shape, the elasticity, these are absolutely critical. They both are needed. Now, there's a lot of regulations on resilience, like the United Kingdoms with the FCA, PRA, Bank of England Operation Resilience Regulation, the EU DORA, Digital Operation Resilience Act, uh, Basel, the Bank for National Settlements Guidance, the US OCC Guidance Operation Resilience. There's a huge focus on resilience. But at the end of the day, resilience is how quickly can I recover? When I have a compliance event in this case, and there's some type of wrongdoing, or maybe it's not wrongdoing, maybe it's just a mistake or something happened. You know, how quickly can I contain that, reduce my compliance risk exposure, and recover? Resilience is extremely important. But what's also important is agility, being able to see what's coming at the organization, what's developing in regulatory trends, and how is it going to impact the organization. Today's compliance program, the strategic compliance program, needs to be agile to know what's coming at the organization and prepare for it, as well as re operation resilient to be able to recover compliance events as well. If you think about it, uh, you know, the whole idea of resiliency is, is the ability to recover from an event. You know, if I'm running down the trail and I trip over a rock or some other obstacle, resilience is how quickly can I get back up and start running again? In this context, if, I, if my or organization is speeding down the trail of business and we have some type of compliance issue, whether it's the malicious uh, or the inadvertent compliance issue, how quickly can I identify that compliance issue, contain it, reduce my risk exposure, and, and get the business running and beyond that? That's important. We need to be resilient. But we also need to be agile. Agility is to be able to see what's coming at me. If I'm running down that, the, that trail or path, being able to leap over obstacles and, and not trip over them, you know, organizations need to be agile. What's developing on the regulatory horizon? What are the regulators saying? What are law, uh, um, uh, legislature, le legislators saying? What's developing? What's the trend in enforcement actions? What's happening out there? What's being stated in, in comments and speeches by regulators? Um, and what, what's developing on the geopolitical risk scene that can impact our regulatory compliance as we've seen so much in 2023? We need to be resilient, but we also need to be agile to be able to see what's coming at the organization, what's trending and developing, so we can avoid those issues as well. But this means that to be creative, not to be creative, to, to be agile and resilient in compliance, we need to have creative compliance thinking. We need to look at compliance risk structurally and creatively. You know, we need to be able to look at compliance risk with the left brain. That's the logical and structured thinking about compliance risks. You know, Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, the author of the Sherlock Holmes series, said, it is a capital mistake to theorize before one has data. Insensibly, one begins to twist facts to suit theories instead of theories to suit facts. This is where we build out our compliance risk models. How often have these compliance events happened? What's been their impact on the organization? What's their likelihood that they're going to occur again in this organization? What's going to be the future impact on it? We build out our compliance risk models to measure and model compliance risk. But the challenge with a compliance model is that a risk model is that there's the real world has too many variables and inputs. Uh, there's always something that can catch us off guard. So not only do we need our left brain thinking about compliance risk, we also need creative right brain thinking. The, the creative imagine thinking about com compliance risk. Uh, you know, we, th this is thinking inside the box. Inside the box is the left brain. Outside the box is the right brain. Alvin Toffler said, you can use all the quantitative data you can get, but you still have to distrust it and use your own judgment. I'm stating that organizations need to use both their left brain and their right brain on our compliance risk management, on developing a strategic compliance approach. What has happened in the past? How has it worked out? How do we build our risk models? That's the left brain thinking on compliance risk. The right brain thinking is, how has the world changed? What were these models failing? Where can they, these models uh, um, break down? What are they not telling us? Good compliance risk management means good information and insights that we can see from multiple angles to, be, to engage both the left brain and right brain thinking on compliance risk. That's strategic compliance. What else is important is your culture. Your compliance culture is absolutely critical to the organization. 
Um, I'm a global ambassador of risk management with the Institute of Risk Management out of London. And a decade ago, we built this great guidance that's still very relevant today called Risk Culture Resources for Practic Practitioners. And in that, we have what we call the ABC model. The attitudes of the individuals in the organization, whether it's frontline employees, middle management, senior executives, those attitudes shapes the behavior of the organization. That behavior forms the culture of the organization, which has a symbiotic relationship that further influences other attitudes and behaviors. And so we, our culture, our compliance and ethical culture is absolutely critical to the organization. And we need to nurture and guide this and develop this correctly in the organization. Our compliance and ethical culture can be destroyed overnight with the wrong mishaps and malicious activities and so forth. But it can take years or even decades to repair a compliance and ethical culture in your organization. We need to nurture and shape that. And a lot of that's done by what I call the human firewall. What is the human firewall? Well, that's that strategic approach to compliance that's engaging employees on policies, clearly written policies, well-written policies that are aligned to the organization that employees understand and have been communicated and engaged on. And in that context, they know what is expected for those attitudes and behaviors. Compliance engagement happens at all levels of the organization in the human firewall, from the frontline employees, the teller at the bank, the insurance agent out there in the field, the doctor or nurse at a hospital, the coal miner in a coal mine. They're all making some type of compliance decisions every hour of the day. But operational and middle management, all the way to senior executives, all have their role in the human firewall, where compliance engagement is necessary from the very top of the organization down to the very depths and edges of the organization and the employees. And how do we communicate what's expected from them to employees and policies and training, activities, reminders, and having that policy portal that they can engage and interact on. Again, that's strategic compliance. What's also important is that we have accountability for compliance. Accountability is different from responsibility. Responsibility is our tasks and activities that I can give to other people and pass around. While accountability means I own this. I have to, I have to do something about this. Um, if there's something wrong, I have to take accountability for it and, and own up to it. Responsibilities I can give to other people, but accountability I cannot. And we're seeing a whole host of accountability regimes for compliance around the world, like the United Kingdom's SMCR, which started it all, Ireland's SEER, Australia's BEAR, now FEAR, uh, Hong Kong's managers in charge, Singapore's individual accountability conduct, South Africa has a new one this year now as well that's all assigning different aspects of accountability for different compliance functions and risk functions in the organization where they're personally accountable. We're seeing a lot of focus on accountability. And here in the US, we're seeing a great focus on accountability as well. There's been a lot of discussions on the liability and exposure of chief ethics and compliance officers. And in the past few weeks, we just saw the chief information security officer at Uber get uh, um, penalized and, and found guilty uh, for covering up things. Uh, there's a greater focus on accountability right now. So we need to, to, to take a, pro, a strategic approach to compliance. We need to herd the cats of that Winchester mystery house of compliance and get different departments and functions working together so that we don't have 27 different policy portals buried in all these different departments. There's a unified policy portal that we have a common approach to managing incidents, investigations, hotlines, and whistleblower events, and doing compliance assessments. We need to be able to get together all these different wandering approaches to compliance and get them together to work strategically. And this should be led by the chief ethics and compliance officer in the organization. It means we need to have a top-down approach to compliance management strategy, where we clearly define what is compliance and ethics, particularly in the era of ESG, uh, how we might have a chief ethics compliance officer in a compliance department, but that compliance itself is a really distributed and federated responsibility because you have HR compliance and IT compliance and quality compliance, environmental compliance and health and safety compliance and sanctions compliance and fraud compliance and third party compliance. And gosh, it goes on and on and on, you know, and how these different teams and functions can work together in approach. There you have com common compliance management processes like uh, managing regulatory change and being able to manage policies and use a common policy template and have one policy portal uh, and, and have a role of policy manager to, keep, to manage the policy process. 
uh, to common investigations and incident management process and hotline and whistleblowing process. So we have common compliance management processes that's built on a uh, common compliance management information or content and technology architecture. Now, a case in point, a global um, high-tech ma uh, uh, hardware manufacturer um, that worked with myself and OSEG on overall compliance management strategy. Uh, and, and in this case, they this is going back a few years, but they um, had several compliance departments. And in this case, they had the corporate compliance and ethics department responsible for things like code of conduct, bribery and corruption, antitrust. They had the Sarbanes-Oxley internal controls compliance department in the county department. They had the government contract procurement office responsible for compliance dealing with uh, uh, government uh, compliance requirements. And they had the import export compliance department uh, dealing with all the complexities of uh, customs and import export and all that. Now, these, all these compliance departments were separate departments and still remain separate departments, but they said, how can we work together cohesively and streamline things and overall strategy process information technology? The first thing they came up with was policies. They found out that each of them had a different policy portal. Between these four different departments, there's four different policy portals, and each of them had a different template for policies and a role of policy manager to keep it current. They said, why don't we streamline this and have one policy portal for compliance across all these departments and functions uh, and one role of a policy manager to keep them current and updated and manage the process and so forth. That's a strategic approach to compliance. Now, as we approach an information technology architecture for compliance, it's important to be able to monitor the external environment of laws and regulations and geopolitical risks and shifts in technology and society, environmental standards and industry practices but also be able to take in the changing internal environment of what's acceptable and unacceptable risk uh, for compliance, the third parties and extended enterprise, what are compliance requirements and controls in the organization, how our strategic and operating plans can change and impact compliance. We need to take all this information and constantly moving elements of compliance and funnel that into you know, understanding of our mission, vision, values, strategy, processes, and roles, understanding our compliance risk, and identify policies that need to be ad addressed and changed in the environment. From there, we need a good content and information architecture that can provide the right people, the right access to the right information at the right time, where you got the chief compliance officer that's there, has the dashboard and insight of what's going on in compliance, what's being communicated to employees out there, um, well, what's being reported in the hotline and helplines and, and whistleblowers and, and issues and be able to see all this information contextually so that the organization isn't caught off guard. And policies are central to this. Policies are governance documents. They define the organization's governance structure, culture, and behavior to reliably achieve objectives. Without good policies as a guide, corporate culture and control of policies and I mean, control of processes morphs and changes and takes unintended paths. Several organizations I've worked with calls their policy management program their governance documents program. But policies are also risk documents. The very fact that we have a policy means somebody's identified a risk. And that risk was significant enough that somebody had to sit behind a word processor and write a document to control that risk. And of course, compliance are documents of integrity for, com for compliance itself. Policies are the foundation for documenting our compliance program and what is going to be expected behavior in the organization. But there's so much happening in the organization. Employees are changing. New ones come in. Are they aware of the policies? Are they trained properly? They change roles and departments and functions. Processes change. Technology change. Uh, so much is changing, but also in the external environment and laws and regulations and risks. Organizations today need a good, strong content and information architecture that can take in distributed and disconnected compliance data points, integrate, understand these contextually, analyze relationships, and build out action items. They need an architecture where we can clearly understand you know, the policies in the environment and how those policies map to the obligations and regulations of the organization, and how those policies and regulations map the organization's structure. Like, is this an entity level policy, like a code of conduct, you know, a process level policy, like accounts payable? Is it an asset level policy, like employee information, like GDPR? And, and so how those policies map to the organization, how the regulations map to the organization as well, um, all that's absolutely critical. And what are the objectives of the organization? Uh, and how do those impact those 
objectives impact the organizational structure? You know, how do those object strategic and department process objectives impact regulatory compliance or policies? I think you get the point. How risks change and how where those risks apply in the organization? Uh, how those risks impact our regulatory obligations and our policies? You know, policies govern controls. That password policy tells you length of password, frequency of change of password, complexity of password. That gift entertainment policy tells you the amount of the gift, the frequency. You can give that gift to any individual or entity over a period of time. Those are controls that get implemented in the environment. But controls also treat risks in the environment to make sure our compliance risks are being addressed. Issues, incidents, cases, and investigations tells us where policies are failing, uh, where controls are missing or needed. You know, how our compliance risk exposure is changing. Uh, how uh, those issues and incidents can be failures and regulatory obligations that need to be reported. And those roles, there's subject matter experts on risks and for com compliance risks. There's compliance risk owners. We need a good information architecture that brings this hub of compliance information together so we can attack and address compliance strategically, strategic compliance, what we're talking about today. That same information technology architecture provides good management reporting where those management reports on compliance are there to push of a button. It doesn't take us 200 hours to build that compliance report for the board of directors. It's there today uh, at, when we need it. There's a strong audit trail system of record of accountability for defensibility, which I'll talk more about in just a few seconds. Uh, and that there's good workflow and tasks where 80% of our staff time isn't spent chasing documents, spreadsheets, and emails for compliance. That it's actually spent managing and improving compliance because there's clear structured accountability and responsibilities. And we can collaborate and monitor enforcement across the environment. Uh, so in that context, you know, we also need to have defensible compliance. This is absolutely critical. Absolutely fundamentally critical in today's organization is defensible compliance, that system of record. What policy was communicating employees and what date and time? How did they access the policy? Were they trained in the policy? Were there exceptions to those policies or those compliance controls? Were those exceptions documented? I mean, if you have exceptions to your gift entertainment policy or other policies and they're not documented, the regulator, external auditors, opposing counsel lawsuit, they're going to have a field day with you. But when you have those records, it's going to show that you're on top of it. Uh, you know, my favorite case in point is the Morgan Stanley case from 10 years back. You know, Morgan Stanley was the first company in FCPA history in 2012. That's 35 years of FCPA history. Uh, gosh, now 45 years, um, you know, going back because uh, FCPA was passed in 1977. Morgan Stanley was the first company that had bribery and corruption happening. Mr. Peterson in the Asian real estate business was doing bad things. It was the first time the SEC and Department of Justice did not go after the company. They just prosecuted the individual. And there's a memo on the, on the Department of Justice website today that praises Morgan Stanley for their defensible compliance. That Morgan Stanley had policies to address bribery and corruption. Those policies kept, were kept current as regulations changed and risks changed. Morgan Stanley can demonstrate how many times Mr. Peterson and other groups of personnel were communicated policies, reminded of policies, trained on policies. Um, they can show how transactions were monitored and due diligence was conducted. It's defensible compliance. My friends, documents, spreadsheets, and emails do not have a defensible audit trail system of record. To me, they don't stand up in court. You can manufacture evidence of compliance in documents, spreadsheets, and emails, and the regulators and law enforcement are catching up on this. And you look at the U.S. Department of Justice uh, Evaluation Compliance Program guidelines that are revised every few years, the, the latest revisions from two years back are get a lot into the audit trail and system of record and defensibility to even having that that portal for policies and showing how many times an employee accessed the policy when they accessed it. You know, documents, spreadsheets, emails, file shares don't give you that defensible compliance. It's time we think about compliance strategically in the organization. It means that we need to have compliance technology that is highly usable for the back office compliance functions, but also the front office employees that can be implemented with a low co total cost of ownership, configurable to the organization's need, that's scalable, adaptable, can integrate with other systems, has robust reporting and uh, analytics, can leverage things like natural language processing to help manage regulatory change in policies, and, and doesn't break on upgrades like some of the older solutions in this space have a history of doing. That can, can deliver a, a variety of compliance metric, metrics and measurements for defensibility of compliance to measure things like what type of questions are coming into the compliance help desk and hotlines around ambiguity and clarity 
on policies and controls and training? You know, what, what type of risk exposure and regulations have changed? And how does it impact our policies and controls in our compliance environment? How has the business changed? What issues and incidents have happened? Are we hiring bad, wicked, evil people? Or is it the fact that our policies are ambiguous and need to be updated? What exceptions are there to policies and controls? Too many exceptions makes a policy a guideline and no longer a policy. Are those policies well documented and approved properly? We need a strong documented evidence trail to be able to show all these metrics and help us improve compliance and manage it strategically. So here's my quick five-step plan. Careful planning is the key to compliance success. Where are you at today with your Winchester mystery house of compliance? What should compliance by design look like in the future, two years from now? And what's your roadmap to get there? The, the, the next thing to consider is who's on your team. You might be the chief ethics and compliance officer, but there's other compliance departments and functions out there like HR compliance and IT compliance and environmental compliance and sanctions and fraud compliance and more. How can you work together? How can you streamline things and make things more efficient, effective, and agile in the organization? Then what's the right technology that can help you achieve your vision for compliance? Uh, so many people start with very siloed technology that might be able to be built for IT compliance, but was never designed for like an enterprise approach to compliance. You need to make sure you have the right compliance architecture with the right technology that can deliver on the complexities of compliance in your organization. From there, you need to break compliance up into stages that are achievable in, in your compliance program as you build towards that future of compliance, that strategic approach to compliance. We also have to be ready for change because the world is very diverse. You know, we dealt with COVID for a few years, and now this last year, it's been geopolitical risks and sanctions through a war and so much uh, risk on inflation and economic concerns. We don't know what's going to come at us next year, but there's also mergers and acquisitions and so much more happening. So strategic compliance means that we're building towards that agile and resilient compliance program where we're more aware of our compliance risks, aware of our policies and controls across compliance departments and functions that we're aligned and can work together. We're more responsive to compliance issues that are developing and can work together. We're agile by monitoring developments that are on the horizon, horizon scanning of regulatory change and geopolitical risks and everything that's happening and, and going through compliance scenarios, how it impacts the organization. But we're resilient for the here and now to find issues, contain them. But we're doing so in a way with technology that makes it our use of human and financial capital resources much more efficient, where it doesn't take 200 hours to build a report, it's there to push of a button, where 80% of our staff time is not spent chasing documents, spreadsheets, and emails, but actually 80% of our time or more is spent managing and improving compliance. So with that, I think we're at our poll question. Okay, thank you very much, Michael. And our polling question in today's session is, are you planning on investing in compliance technology in 2023? and the available answers are yes or no. Now please, uh, please select the answer relevant to you and click submit. Your feedback is very important to us and we will appreciate your votes. I will give you 45 seconds before we take a look at the poll results and you can start voting now. Okay, 20 seconds left. We have several responses already. Ten seconds left. Okay, let's now see the results. Okay, 47% voted yes and 52 voted no. Thank you very much for your votes. And uh, okay, that's okay. Yeah, and now please allow me to welcome Freddie Fries. Over to you, Freddie. Great, thank you so much. And thank you, Michael, for going through what was a very rich and detailed presentation on um, strategic and effective compliance programs. What we're gonna be doing now is gonna be focusing on one of the constituent parts of a strategic compliance program, which is policy management. 
Over the next 10 to 15 minutes, we're going to be focusing on these four key learnings. And if there's anything that I would like you to walk away with, it's the following. How to assess your policy management capability, the challenges and pitfalls of policy management, understanding an alternative, which is an integrated and automated policy management solution, and then providing you some supporting case studies of how policy management technology is already supporting a large tier one bank as well as some high growth fintechs. So the first section um, has been created and co-created, I guess, um, with um, the help of uh, Michael Rasmussen. But before jumping into that, it'd be rude to not give you a very brief overview and introduction to Clause Match itself. So Clause Match, we're an award-winning uh, regulatory technology provider that operates globally. As you can see, we work with a wide range of financial institutions or services companies that cover all industries from banking, insurance, payments, fintech, investment management. And the common denominator between all of these organizations is that before using a tool like Clause Match, they all experienced very similar challenges of which Michael um, did a very good job ex explaining, which is they're relying on general and generic business tools such as Word, multiple share drives, uh, spreadsheets to support what are quite complicated um, uh, and specialist uh, requirements and processes to which they need a tool to help support them in a more scalable compliance program. So at the risk of repeating um, uh, uh, what was shared in the previous presentation, I will keep this piece short and sweet, but why do policies matter? Well, policies matter for a few key reasons, as already mentioned, but the first is around articulating governance culture. Policies drive the business in achieving its performance object objectives and by clearly defining the behaviors, processes, and transactions in meeting those. And it provides uh, the business the frameworks in order to create the right decisions instead of the wrong ones. In addition, policies also articulate risk culture. So as Michael already um, mentioned, policies clearly define the roles, the responsibilities, the thresholds, the appetite, the communication that relates to mitigating or manage, managing risks. Risks are supposed to be in businesses and for good reason. It helps them move forward and achieve objectives. However, if decisions are made at an individual's risk appetite rather than the businesses, there potentially may be some challenges. And then finally, policies articulate compliance culture. So policies at a minimum should be able to clearly establish how the business meets regulatory or legal requirements, but then also drives ethical standards um, as well as providing the business a defensible position. For example, um, if you are um, mandating that uh, all group policies have to be um, read and understood by an attestation, um, if someone is to then go against that policy, at least it provides evidence of the fact that that policy had been read and understood, rather than just having the policy written or um, not operationalized or embedded into the business. So we know why policies matter. Um, one of the really amazing pieces of work that we've actually done with Michael is the policy management maturity model, which is a model that we use to help support conversations with our clients and prospective clients to allow them to understand where they are in their policy management maturity journey and where they may want to be with the support of technology like Clause Match. There are a number of, st of stages um, and each stage um, isn't always a reflection on compliance competency, but it may actually also be a reflection on where the business is in its maturity level as a whole. For example, ad hoc stage really normally typically explains a business that either is not highly regulated or if highly regulated is at the infancy stage in its maturity. For example, an organization that's applying for a license and therefore its policies, procedures, processes, controls have typically been drafted by lawyers or consultants and have not yet been embedded into the business to which then resource is not put in place to actually operationalize all of those key areas. 
We then have two, uh, I guess, stages that typically reflect most of our clients before using clause match, and that is fragmented or defined. And I'll explain why they typically um, have a relationship between one another. Normally, most organizations understand what good looks like, or at least have a defined way of working. Typically, this may be run by governance, risk, legal or compliance functions. However, what typically happens is maybe the systems, the frameworks or the processes are not normally in place to create a uniform or standardized defined way of working across the enterprise. And therefore, typically what we find is we have clients uh, that have this tension between knowing what good looks like and knowing what their defined way of working should be, but because of maybe organizational complexity or different varying levels of competency across functions, they move in and out of this fragmented and defined way of working. Well, our hypothesis is that to be able to move forward in the maturity of policy management, you need a system that supports the defined way of working, creates standardized ways of working across the organizations, hold people accountable, and uses um, modern technology to streamline, automate, and manage the end-to-end -end life cycle of policies. And that typically explains the next two stages, which is either integrated or agile. Integrated being that there's complete alignment between functions and business units with consistent strategies and frameworks also potentially integrated with other key systems such as GRC tools, through to Agile, which, which explains this Nirvana state of policy management where there's a fully collaborative way of working on policies with consistent processes across the organization using automated and easy to use integrated technology. So um, for people that are listening in, feel free to use the Q&A um, uh, function to share what stage you believe your uh, business is or, or organization is on this maturity model. Um, it will be interesting to see what the answers are. So why do organizations struggle with their policy management maturity? Um, and so at Clause Match, we believe it's because typically general business tools aren't fit for purpose to solve what are policy management requirements. They will and they should have good use in organizations, but they should be used for general business use. And instead, they are used to solve what are complicated policy review cycles, regulatory change processes, and coordination between lots of different stakeholders with different roles and responsibilities. And this typically leads to a number of challenges, um, but some of the common ones include manual and time-consuming administrative tasks. Um, Michael did a great job uh, and, and rightly explained that there's so many administrative burdens due to the siloed and manual nature of systems used. Uploading, downloading, multiple portals across the organization, challenges with versioning, capturing reports on master spreadsheets, it's a nightmare. And this also leads into the next challenge, which is a lack of evidence and traceability. Lack of evidence on being able to evidence the decision making that went into an update, whether that is information requested from the board or externally from auditors or regulators. Also challenges around traceability. So being able to clearly show the relationship between maybe group level and local level policies, um, all the way through the hierarchy of documents through to procedures and processes, or even being able to link policies back to regulations to evidence that you're meeting that requirement. At the moment, it's really difficult if you're not using a built for purpose tool. And finally, the last challenge is, you know, the nature of the above is that it's disconnected and siloed. So why does any of this matter? Well, it matters for different reasons to different types of organizations. And so we're now gonna sort of shift into this lens of a case study uh, and talking through how Clause Match actually helps different types of organizations from traditional large uh, incumbents through to high growth newcomers. So why would um, making uh, changes and improvements to your policy management capability matter to a traditional incumbent like a big tier one bank? Well, the first piece is it simplifies your operational and regulatory complexity. Nearly every large bank that I speak to every week, they all have what they call a rationalization or simplification project, which is ultimately to just 
make sense of what currently is happening in their document um, environment and being able to simplify it so they actually understand which is the latest version um, and who are the relevant owners and who is accountable for what. And so being able to use a tool that instantly provides simplification in terms of understanding your policy environment will not only uh, bring about better governance, reduced risk, but also reduced cost, because it actually means you have less policies to have to review and update on an annual basis. It also is important because it improves enterprise level coordination and collaboration. Time back to the point that I mentioned around traceability is that policies and procedures are not standalone documents. They're all interconnected. Uh, one change to a policy may impact another policy or a procedure. And that means that multiple stakeholders in the organization should be involved in the review of documentation. And with the tools that are used today or typically used, collaboration is difficult. And then ultimately cost and resource savings. As we enter the market that we're in today, um, firstly, it's very difficult to um, evidence uh, cost savings related to compliance efforts um, as regulatory um, a complexity does not decrease. However, budgets are being put on freeze. So it's really important to be able to say, well, can we um, put tools in place that actually provide a streamlined and scalable approach to the way in which we manage policies? On the other hand, we have what we call our high growth newcomers, fintechs, payments, and other types of neo-based industries. The first reason to get policy management right is it provides support for a scalable and more importantly, sustainable compliance program. Um, as regulatory obligations grow, as you enter new jurisdictions, as business um, uh, functions change to accommodate the company's growth and new people come into the business, policy management should be at the heart of the organization. And therefore it's really important to get policy management right and make sure that you have a tool in place that allows you to scale it effectively in business. It also demonstrates compliance and governance maturity. And so when we speak to uh, you know, uh, challenger banks or neobanks that have just attained their banking license, they are quickly going through different levels of maturity to either, um, I guess, satisfy the regulator, but also um, new customers, larger customers, as well as investors, which um, more money br brings more obligations in terms of governance and the way in which you approach your, your um, documentation in the business. And then finally, this piece actually is relevant to all types of organizations, but it makes compliance a competitive advantage. So being able to say that you're putting your best foot forward in terms of using best-in-class tools to solve a component of a compliance program um, will firstly make the board happy, will make regulators happy, and will make auditors happy. It also attracts really good talent because you're actually using tools that makes compliance and other subject matter experts' lives easier. And it also will attract bigger clients because it shows that you're actually wanting to manage the way in which you uh, manage your risk and compliance in the business effectively. So what is the solution? And in this case, it's clause match. And uh, we're going to quickly be looking at two of the key modules that solve the full policy management lifecycle for our clients. And the first one is what we call the policy management module. One of our key differentiators is that clause match captures the full life cycle of um, a policy or a procedure or another type of governance document. And how do we do that? We digitize documents into our own proprietary format to which it then allows you to draft, review, approve, finalize, map related policies and report on them all in one place without having to check that document in and out, which then leads to time and additional risk. Two key areas that typically our clients benefit from most is our concept of templates. Templates do more than just enforce structure, look and fill. They do two other key elements. They allow documents to sing off the same hymn sheet from a governance workflow perspective, meaning that we have workflow automation that coordinates with committees, individuals, and relevant stakeholders to get that document signed off quickly. 
The second area is that it actually allows you to standardize the collection of metadata, i.e. things that you want to report on. So this provides then real-time reports and dashboards on the status of all your documents. The second key area is what we call mappings, where we're able to map policies to other related documents, um, such as procedures or other policies, and also map policies back to regulations. The area that's so impressive in this is that we're actually able to map not only just a document to a document, but we're able to map a paragraph in a document to another paragraph. For example, a specific part of a regulation to a specific part of a policy that evidence that we are meeting that requirement through this policy. And those relationships are dynamic. So when one change occurs to another, you're able to see the cascade of that impact. But that's all well and good. You may have a really amazing way of maintaining, updating and managing policies, but how do you make sure that we embed that into the business? And that's what we do through the policy portal. So it's that single source of truth for all employees to access the latest, most up-to-date version of policies or procedures, and also for compliance or other functions to leverage our attestation feature. And that is to request that employees click that they've read and understood the policy, supported with analytics to check whether someone has just scrolled down to the bottom or if they actually took the time to read that policy. Um, for employees to understand what's actually changed from the previous version and to have a really simple user experience to make policies quick and easy to find because not everyone likes policies. So, to accommodate time and not overrun, I'll just focus on two case studies very quickly. The first one is one of our clients, Barclays, who use Clause Match to manage all of their global policies. And their main objective was to digitize compliance and reduce policy management complexity. And so what we're able to do is move them away from a siloed way of working into a platform where real-time collaboration can take place between hundreds of people. Also providing them a digitized central source for all policies and procedures accessible from any location in the world. And we also provided some really good ROI. So approval times reduced by 50% and the overall run cost on policy management uh, was 25%. On the other hand, we work with a really exciting company called Pension B that at the start of our partnership were preparing for an IPO. And so they wanted to put a robust policy management framework and system in place to allow them to satisfy um, the uh, public market, but also provide a scalable and streamlined way of working on policies as the business grew. So that's my presentation and thank you for everyone listening. Happy to take questions. Um. Okay, thank you very much for this presentation. Um, I would like to mention that the slides will be available on demand right after the webinar. And uh, just a reminder for the audience, in order to ask questions, you can send them in via the questions widget. Uh, just type them into the box at the top right-hand corner of your screen and click Submit. Please note uh, that you can still send your questions after the webinar and they will be available to be answered at a later date. Okay. It looks like we've got several questions already. Okay, the first question is, um, with the economic uncertainty, why should a company invest in a tool like Close Match? Yeah, it's, it's an absolute great question. And I think firstly, the only reason you would ever invest in a, in a tool is because you initially have pain or areas of improvement in the, the challenges that the solution provides. So firstly, if policy governance, policy management is an area for improvement, for example, you notice that your capacity is um, uh, becoming very thin around uh, applying uh, people, time and effort to policies, well, then you've got a reason to use a tool like Clause Match. If, for example, you're a high growth fintech and you're noticing that you're having to have more and more localized subject matter expertise in terms of managing policies from a group to local level, well, there you have a use case for using Clause Match. So the first thing is you just, you should, there's no point implementing a platform unless you really have a pain or a requirement around, uh, for example, the, uh, the challenge you're looking to solve. 
And then that should really spur on conversations with not any, uh, with not just clause match, but with any regtech provider. And typically you'll be looking to solve three key things. Does the regtech provider reduce time or cost? Does the regtech provider allow us to provide speed to market or um, make more money? Or does the regtech provider mitigate some sort of risk? And so what I urge anyone who's assessing regtech or speaking to vendors is to look at the platform through that lens, then formalize your own requirements and then have discussions on, well, what does it satisfy and what does it mean? Okay, thank you very and much. I, I would add to that and building a business case for technology like clause match is that in that business case, I focus on the angles of efficiency, effectiveness, and agility, which really uh, translate well to what Freddie just put forth, but efficient is time saved, money saved, traditional ROI. Uh, effectiveness is risk reduction, less things slipping through cracks, greater accuracy, thoroughness, better documentation, audit trail. But the, the agility is the ability to keep up with all the change, the regulatory change, the business change, and keep all that in sync. Okay, uh, thank you very much. And uh, our next question is, uh, when talking to prospective clients, what stage of the policy management maturity model do most of them fall under? So, yeah, that's a great question. Um, I think firstly, um, there is a, firstly, we experience people misunderstanding what the maturity model is and they normally look at it through the lens of the business. So normally if you're speaking to a FinTech, they say we're agile and then you dig a little bit deeper and you notice actually what well, the compliance and risk program is far from that. Um, so firstly, you need to understand what the, the compliance maturity or the policy management maturity model is looking to achieve. But most typically it's normally this tension between defined and fragmented. They may have tools in place that provides efficiencies in a really specific part of the com compliance program or in a specific part of policy management. They may have a great portal that distributes policies really well, but they actually notice on the back end the way in which they approach policy updates is really disjointed and fragmented. Well, that doesn't mean you have an agile policy management capability. So yeah, typically uh, between uh, fragmented and defined. I think Michael um, has m much broader conversations with the market on policy management too, so you may have a different view. No, that, that's right. Okay, thank you very much. And our next question is, uh, how do you improve policy awareness and engagement? To me, that's what I call the human firewall. And it starts with well-written policies that are clear and easily understood that it doesn't take a, a, you know, some a PhD to decipher and understand, uh, that use the active voice, not the passive voice, um, uh, um, and are as concise as possible. But well-written policies are not enough. You also have to make sure that those policies are um, properly understood and engaged. And so the, the, that means a strong portal to be able to access those policies uh, where employees can find what's relevant to them uh, and, and find it when they need it. Um, uh, and, and so the accessibility of those is absolutely critical. Uh, a, a third thing is training on that, because particularly in high risk areas is, be, is how do we know that those employees really understand and comply that policy in, in their context? Uh, from there, also being able to clearly identify when, when to report compliance issues and incidents is also critical. And another thing to look at is the extended enterprise, because today's modern business isn't defined by traditional brick and mortar walls and employees, but it's an extended web of contractors, consultants, temporary workers, outsourcers, service providers, vendors, suppliers, and more. Uh, and and those, a lot of policies cross into third party extended business relationships as well. Oh, thank you. And uh, the next question is, how do you force ownership and accountability on updating policies rather than relying on compliance? This is a, a great one and is always at the top of business cases for um, uh, typically mid-market and enterprise organizations where compliance are burdened with having to bang the drum on policies getting updated. Um, well. I can talk to it through the lens of clause match and then I'm sure Michael may want to add on, but the one thing that clause match allows our clients to do is clearly define the parameters. For example, taking a policy on policy and actually embedding it into the solution design of the system, meaning that a policy has to look 
and feel a certain way um, signed by the template. A policy has to go through a specific set of governance processes in uh, such as the review and approval process. And before a policy gets updated, it has to um, be reported and information has to be captured in a certain way, which is put on the accountability and ownership of the policy owner rather than it being the compliance people to have to chase people to do things. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Uh, we actually have time for one more question. And our next question is, how do you evidence cost savings with clause match? So how do you evidence cost savings with clause match? You can do it multiple ways. I think the first piece, sort of the, the headline is reduce time uh, of uh, managing and updating policies, which is what clause match allows you to achieve, allows you to reduce the run cost because it means that, you know, the time of which salaries are attached to policy review cycles equals um, a cost to the business. Now, then what you need to do is, and we've already ev evidenced this through a case study, which I recommend you finding on our website, it's called the Barbican Insurance Case Study, um, where it allowed uh, our client to um, achieve 30% cost savings, is to understand where are the cost savings um, created. One area was, well, we reduced the actual steps it took for a policy to get approved by the committee and uh, the board. Rather than it having to take 10 steps, it only took five. Well, there's a cost saving. Um, we also, by bringing stakeholders into a central document, meant that there wasn't that whole issue of going back and forth through track changes, capturing multiple versions and consolidating them because it all took place in one place. Well, that's time saved. Um, and then finally, just one other example would be reports. Typically, reports are put together manually. Well, because the whole life cycle of Clause Match is managed through the platform, along with metadata, there's real-time reporting, which people then don't have to put together and don't have to scramble to put together for the board or other committees. So they're just a few examples. Okay, thank you very much. And just a reminder for the audience, you can still send in any questions while watching on demand. All questions will be available to be answered at a later date. In addition, the slides of today's presentation will be available on demand as uh, along with, other, with the other resources at the bottom of your screen. I would like to thank Michael and Freddy for this presentation and close much for sponsoring this session. To, to the attendees, you will receive an email telling you how you can ac access the on-demand version of this webinar, or you can access this through our website, which is www.pmi-life.com. We look forward to sharing further webinars with you, so please do keep an eye out on the website just mentioned. Follow us on Twitter at BR Webinars for daily updates and join our LinkedIn group, Business Review Webinars PMI. Thank you once again. And I hope you all have a, a very nice day. Bye.